Hi there everyone, we are at the US Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama. They've got all sorts of amazing stuff here on display, huge rockets, it's one of the best museums you'll ever see, but of course I've come straight to the archives and I'm here with Ed, who's in charge, and he's going to show me some cool stuff to do with one of my favorite space missions, Apollo 15. Apollo 15 really was the first of the Apollo flights where science was the main driving force behind it. They expanded the astronauts' ability to explore the surface, take samples from a varied set of areas, instead of just kind of the immediate walking area around the lander. And that brings us to our first object, first of three objects, and it's this huge thing in front of us here. Tell us what we're looking at, Ed. So this is a 3D topographical map of the lunar surface in the area of Hadley Row, which was the Apollo 15 landing site. This particular version of this map is a kind of an expanded polystyrene with sort of a really nice print of some satellite images of the lunar surface. And then what they've done is they've tracked where they intended to land, and then they sort of mapped out the areas where the Apollo 15 crew would be taking the lunar rover. Okay, so if we see here, it says target point, mm -hmm. and then here we have a little sticker, obviously, where they finally landed. But these yes. tracks, these are long distances. These are in the rover. This is a drive. Correct. I know from a little bit of reading I've done, this was considered a bit of a daring place to land. Some people within NASA were saying, let's play it safe, let's play it safe. But there, right. was, a, there was a real push from the science community saying, no, this is where we're going to find interesting science stuff. Absolutely. And that was true. They did find a lot of interesting oh, yeah. stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that came out of this particular mission is something called the Genesis Rock which of course is a really nicely sized lunar sample that is the oldest piece of the crust that they found during the course of the Apollo lunar exploration. So it was a huge boon for lunar geologists. And so this is Apollo 15 sample 15415. It's the Genesis rock. Look at that. Wow. Almost see twinning in there. Guess what we just found. I think we found what we came for. Crystal rock, huh? Yes, sir. You better believe it. To give you kind of an idea of scale, this map is a 1 to 12,500 scale. So imagine this valley that you see here, yeah. only almost 13,000 times larger and deeper. So it's really a fascinating bit of geography on the lunar surface and kind of a bit of a dangerous one too. And having the rover and being able to go out these long distances gave them the ability to really get a lot of information about it. I can't believe uh, we came over those mountains. They, we did. They're just a beautiful little valley. So, we mentioned the lunar rover. Mm -hmm. Our next object is something lunar rover related. What on earth is this contraption? So, this is the rack that would have been on the back of the lunar rovers right. to hold their geological hammers, their dust brushes, their core sample tubes, those sorts of things. And the lightsaber obviously goes in that slot there. No good spacefarer would dare go to somewhere like the moon without their lightsaber. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There we go. So they obviously left the lunar rovers behind. So this isn't from an actual lunar rover. What's this one from? So this one would most likely have been a training and testing piece. Right. So when you build spaceflight hardware, you build your flight versions, and then you build at least a couple that are also flight-like. And they're flight-like so that you can train your crew and also to do sort of final qualification testing. So whether it needs to be a vibration test or vacuum chamber test, the hardware that you want to test at that stage needs to be pretty pretty much exactly like what you're going to take to orbit or the lunar surface or wherever it is that you're going. So this is as good as the real thing, like this is pretty much exactly what would have been bolted onto the real one. Absolutely. And in case you're wondering, can I lift this up? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's quite light. It's much lighter than it looks. And every tool has its spot, so there's not really like, oh, well, I'll just put the hammer here and the brush here. Everyone was set to go in a specific slot. And that slot was designed not only to make it easy for the astronauts to use, but to also guarantee that it would be secure during launch. Now, here on Objectivity, one thing we really like is gloves. And we're going to finish today's episode with an Apollo glove. Pretty cool. Absolutely. Have a look at that. Not bad, hey? What are we looking at here? So this is an Apollo A7L lunar overglove. It is the type of glove that would have been used on most of the Apollo spacesuits that were on the lunar surface. And then they did continue to use a very similar style for like the Skylab program and their in-flight EVAs and that sort of thing. It's a multi-layer glove, so about 21 layers. 
Uh, you've got the sort of stainless mesh that you see on the outside, the silicone fingertips. So you've got insulation, micrometeoroid protection, pressure you know, regulation, all that is sort of built into this element of the glove to protect the astronaut's hands, but also give them a modicum of dexterity while they're working on the lunar surface. And so whose yeah. glove is this? So this is uh, Ken Mattingly's glove. And uh, each glove was actually custom fit to the astronaut's hands. So inside the glove, there's a tag that has his name on there. And a lot of these elements will say, instead of a size like small, medium, large, will say size Mattingly or size Cernan, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, Ken Mattingly, he was the chap that was going to fly on the ill-fated right. Apollo 13 but got sick and didn't go. Yes. And then he did fly on Apollo 16. Absolutely. If you'll just steady the base, yep. I will lift him off his mount. Okay. And you can see this one is without the pressure garment layer, but you can see the tag with his name, manufactured April 1969, the model number, which is an A7LB, which is on there. And then you've got serial numbers and a little bit more information who manufactured it that sort of thing. Can I just put my hand in it for a second and pretend? Oh, I can feel the power, <laughs> feel the power coursing through my veins. <laughs> it's the nearest I'll ever get. Thank you yeah. so much. These were great. My pleasure. To see. Absolutely. Great to see. This actual 747 was originally owned by American Airlines and it did transport people uh, in transcontinental across the ocean flights until NASA procured it or bought it from American Air Airlines back in the 70s. NASA did need to transport some of the ground crew, the people to secure the shuttles, secure the plane on both ends, both at Edwards Air Force Base and at the Kennedy Space Center. Am I allowed to sit in one? Sure, sure. Whoa. 